Hello everybody, Jason here. <laughs> no glasses. Um, I will show you why in just a moment. Claire from the monitor! <laughs> Not exactly the most optimal setup. Um, so anyways, let me introduce what I'm hoping will be a new series of videos, uh, actually kind of in replacement for all the uh, <laughs> issues I've been having doing Let's Plays with Kerbal Space Program, because I like too many mods that don't always like each other. <laughs> um, but anyways, I'm, and I've kind of wanted to make a bit of a change in what I do with my YouTube channel for a while anyways, translating it more into, I guess you could call it stream of consciousness, um, just sort of dumping my own thoughts, ideas, and whatnot into a public format. Um, almost, almost kind of a, um, kind of like what I've been doing with Twitter lately, actually. <laughs> Even though Twitter is not exactly the haven of, um, of vast, massive amounts, of, eh, massive amounts of intellectual discourse, which I tend to like. But anyways. Um, I figure, you know, YouTube might give me a chance to engage in an extra level that I, I kind of have wanted to for a bit now. I may get back into the Let's Plays. It depends on how I'm feeling about it. I'm, I'm, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Um, if I, if I do, I'll probably start doing a different format or style or probably even different games with the Let's Plays. I have done a lot of sandbox-ish games thus far and, that's worked for me, but we'll see. I, I might change that around. But anyways, so what this what this series is is, and I don't know how often I'll do it. I'll, I'll start off once a week. I might do it less. I might do it more. The once a week thing worked for Kerbal Space Program pretty well, and since this is in a way kind of a, a replacement for it, I figure once a week is a good starting point here. Um, this is going to be just me talking about random stuff that happens to be on my mind. A stream of consciousness style. So, I'm sure I will bore plenty of you to tears. Some of you will probably, I will probably get lots of unsubscribes from this. So, <laughs> I can live with that though. Um, but I did feel the need to start engaging in a more public discussion about a lot of the things that have been on my mind lately. Um, and for those of you who have found and have followed me on Twitter, um, you'll know that I have kind of dived into the whole Gamergate thing, and I've also had some very interesting discussions about feminism as of late. Um, and that's, so I've, I've kind of wanted to engage a little bit more in some of those regards, and some of the other, you know, thoughts, ideas, and whatnot that I've had spewing about in my head as of late. <laughs> so that's what this is basically for. So, um, and the idea is, is to keep these no longer than about a half an hour. Uh, believe me, I can ramble on for much longer than that, but I'm going to try to keep it to about a half an hour. It'll be a little easier to do this time, too, because I won't have to be gaming and keeping track of the time at the same time, which I'm not terribly good at, to be honest. <laughs> I tend to do better of, ooh, I'm playing a game. I'm still playing a game. Oh, it's five hours later. I'm still playing a game. <laughs> instead of actually keeping track of how long I've been at it. so. But I digress. Um, so for this sort of inaugural episode, um, I did kind of want to do this as something of a response to a YouTube video that I just recently watched by Girl Writes What. Um, I'm actually very fond of her videos. It's a, it's a very refreshing take on some of the more mainstream um, perceptions mainstream modern feminist perceptions. <laughs> Let me first clarify what I mean by modern feminist. Um, when I say that, I'm pointing more towards the current third wave feminism that's out there. The and, and this this is this is more what I identify as the Andrea Dworkin style of feminism. The ah men are only good for potentially procreating; otherwise, they should be left on an island to fend for themselves and are useless to society. Blah 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 blah. Uh, granted, I am exaggerating her position a bit. I believe I I haven't dug into Dworkin as much as I probably should, and what little I have dug into is certainly more than I'd like to, just because it's a it's a bit too vitriolic for me. Um, 
So when I when I talk about modern feminism or third wave feminism, that's that that that's sort of the ah, monitor being thing. I need to turn off the automatic screensaver thing when this is recording. It's actually kind of annoying. It does that, anyways. Um, that's the feminism I'm talking about. The the more the more vitriolic, the more anti male um, kind of feminism. The the it's kind of the affirmative action version of feminism, and I've, I've got issues with it in general, but um, Go Writes What actually does a really good job of discussing a lot of the ideas and concepts that comes out of that third wave feminism, which is built off of first and second wave stuff, don't get me wrong. It, it, there's there's a lot in third wave feminism that is an extension, and in some ways a very logical extension off of first and second wave feminism. And I definitely support first wave feminism. I a little bit more cautiously, but still support second wave feminism. Um, don't support third wave feminism. <laughs> I really don't. <laughs> um, but the, the, a lot of third wave feminist ideas are logical extensions off of first and second wave feminism ideas, with a slant on it that I feel takes it to such an extreme that the argument then begins to break down. And this is actually a common criticism I have with any philosophy, or, or rather any philosopher. Um, like one of my one of my all time favorites is uh, Nietzsche. You know, he's got this wonderful core idea about how adversity makes you strong. And <laughs> one of his famous oh god, I, I'm going to paraphrase this. But one of the fam one of the things he's famous for saying is that he wishes upon his friends suffering, challenge, hardship, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, with the idea that that's what makes a person grow. And I I love that idea. I love that core concept. But it gets taken too far after a while. And I think that anyone with a great idea or a really interesting philosophy or whatnot does this. They push it farther than it was meant to go and start to narrow their vision down to the point where it's it's a problem, um, where they start to exclude other explanations that are just as valid and legitimate. And one of the best examples I can actually provide of this is Anita Sarkeesian's videos, which I love her work. It's great. The, the analysis parts of her work are really good. The conclusions, I think, aren't quite up to snuff. But the reason for that is that I don't feel that she fully utilizes the academic resources that are at her disposal to do these do these analyses. The issue is is that she's using a singular um, framework to look at what she's looking at. You know, it's it's, it's a it's a framework that's designed to specifically identify individual instances where behavior can be interpreted in a anti-woman fashion. Yes, it does ignore some of the broader context of what's going on, but it's also very specific in identifying very objective, very objective um, experiences in gaming. So in that way, it's very easy to come to the same for different people to come to the same conclusions with that data and with that framework. So it's it's pretty valid. It's a really valid way of looking at it. It's just not comprehensive because it's only looking at those specific things. It's ignoring the broader context. It's ignoring other explanations that could that could or other frameworks that could provide different and equally valid explanations. You could you could use a um, you could use a civil rights perspective looking at um, racial issue, racial disparity issues. You could do a, a class analysis as well in the same fashion, and they would all explain different aspects, different angles, and different factors of the same situation. And none of them are inherently wrong. It's just that they're not fully inclusive of everything that exists within that realm, which is fine. I mean, that's this is a common thing in pretty much any realm of academia, especially in social sciences, because social sciences are a really tough one to get a grasp on. But so and that's and that's that's kind of the issue that I've got with third wave uh, modern feminism is that it's it, it kind of doing that first wave was great. Love first wave, you know, women having the right to vote and, you know, especially, you know, my, my, my first wave feminism hero, Emma Goldman, 
you know, literally getting arrested for going around with like a portable um, stand booth thing to help provide contraceptive options to women. That is so cool. I mean, that is like, I mean, it's not cool that she got arrested, but it's, 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 eh, dang thing. It is, it is really cool that she pushed the idea that women should have control over their, their, their sexual lives, basically. That is awesome. And I, I think that that's a great thing to support. Second wave feminism, you know, was a, was um, a little bit more, we pushed the, the reproductive rights aspect even farther, which is great. I mean, I, I certainly think that a lot of the reason that we have the contraceptive options that we do today is because of second wave feminism. Um, and, you know, a lot of that stuff is really cool. Third wave feminism seems to be taking it that extra step in from advocating for women to have more options to advocating for men to have less in a lot of ways. And one of the things that I'm always challenged with is that men's voice seems to get snuffed out on that, mine in particular. And I'll, I'll be bringing up some examples of that later on once I start digging more into Girl Writes What's uh, video. And I'll, I'll be linking the video you know, below, down in the comment, the sec, uh, this description-y section-y thing. I don't remember what it is off the top of my head. So, um, so I feel very strongly that modern third wave feminism has kind of taken this extremist position where it's focusing on the idea that a feminist framework is the only way to explain things. And I mean, it is a way to explain things and to, to, to sort of dig into some of the stuff that Girl Writes What <laughs> um, had mentioned in her video. I mean, she, she talks a little bit about um, how this feminist framework is used to sort of beat down men who um, identify as being in the friend zone as or, or uh, men who identify as nice guys who are perpetually in the friend zone. Um, full disclosure, I fully identify myself in that way in several occasions. <laughs> um, by saying that there's a feminist a feminist discourse about how exactly men who say they're in the friend zone aren't actually nice guys. And it's not to say that that's an unreasonable conclusion. Given the framework, given how the analytical framework of the, this, this, the, of, of feminism structures, what it focuses on, what it prioritizes, what it doesn't prioritize, what it includes and what it excludes, it is actually a rational, logical conclusion to come to that men who are claiming this nice guy, -ish, the, the, the claiming this sort of friend zone nice guy -ishness aren't actually nice guys. Again, though, it doesn't actually incorporate all information in. Because like any good framework, any good analytical framework, decisions are made about what information is relevant and what information is not relevant. I mean, you, you, the, the whole point of a framework is to simplify the, simplify one's, simplify a situation to the point where a, conclu a conclusion can be drawn to make a decision, you know, to, 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 to engage in some sort of action or whatnot. It's like with any sort of analytical framework at all. The idea is not to capture reality in its perfect true state. Because if you did that, you defeat the purpose of having a framework. The idea of a framework is to simplify things so you can come to a much easier conclusion that you can reference back to identify and, and basically justify. Um, now, yeah, there's more to it than that with, with what a framework can do, but that kind of captures a lot of what, a, what frameworks are used for and kind of the, the meat and the, the meat and potatoes of what a framework is and how, how it can be used. Um, so I'm not inherently objectionable to the idea that from a feminist perspective, men who make this nice guy um, friend zone claim aren't actually nice guys. But again, it's not fully inclusive of everything that's going on. And I, I think Girl Writes What does a really good job of, of presenting an alternative framework that that shifts the that shifts the the conclusion onto the woman who's making that assessment with the idea that with with the idea that 
her framework is incorporating this idea of this kind of duality of existence where, you know, the, fem the, the sort of third wave feminist claim on the one side is that they like nice guys and then on the other side, they're not actually acting in a fashion that confirms their like of such guys. So in, in, in a way, it's, it's um, ah, losing my words here. In a way, it's, all right, I, I forget the actual technical definition, but it's when you hold two contradictory ideas in your head and, and the way that you resolve it. Um, I, I don't remember that there's a psychological word for it that I'm totally blanking on. Please diss on me in the comments below for not actually remembering what it is. <laughs> so um, cognitive dissonance. Ah, there we go. It, it's, it's basically a form of cognitive dissonance. So in a way, Girl Writes What is using a, a psychological framework with around cognitive dissonance to, to, to explain what's going on as an alternative to the feminist um, framework that, you know, third wave feminism is arguing about how, how these, uh, the, the, these nice guy friend zoned, uh, individuals aren't actually nice. Whereas, you know, with the with the cognitive dissonance model, these nice guys are actually nice, um, and the the challenge and the confusion lies with the woman who's making the perception. So, and the thing is, is that I actually agree with both. Now, you know, which one's the which one is like more true than the other? I have no idea. I it's it's one of those complicated things that it's really a variety of different factors, and there are, I imagine, many ways to interpret those kinds of situations. Um, so that's, that's kind of half of what I wanted to talk about right now. There was this other, this other interesting facet that, and I, I imagine Gore Wright's what has probably talked about this in other videos, but I, I haven't exactly gone through the entire album of videos she's got, because there's quite a lot there. <laughs> um, part of it, though, has to do with how third wave feminism kind of takes this, double standard in terms of when a systemic uh when a systemic analysis is appropriate um when examining you know is men men's issues and women's issues as one of the things that popped up in my mind um and has also come up in my own personal experience is that you know as a guy who who i'm not going to say perpetually exists in the friend zone but it certainly comes up often enough um as a guy who's who's basically friend zone, and I consider myself to be a nice guy, I think I've got some evidence to support this too. That's a conversation for another day. Um, but let's just, for the sake of argument, assume that I am a nice guy and that I have gotten friend zone plenty of times. So, with my own experience in discussing that, one of the things that comes up is that I feel that there's a systemic issue around how men and women are framed in our society. A lot of the the sort of the 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 gendered normative assumptions of behavior, you know, what, how men and women are supposed to operate in society and some of the psychological underpinnings um, that that happens with. Um, because, you know, I, I, I'm not, I'm not exactly an alpha male. I'm, I would, I'm not exactly even a beta male. I'm, I'm something else <laughs> in a lot of ways. There are things I'm alpha ish. There's things I'm beta with ish. There's things I'm, something else entirely ish so i don't know but i don't i don't fall into that sort of alpha male personality type um uh, and whenever i try to discuss this especially with women keep in mind i've spent most of my time around very liberally minded women so who have I, not all of them identify as feminists but many of them have a concept of the world that mirrors a lot of feminist ideas. Um, and not that it's right or wrong, you know, that's just what they believe. Just like what I believe is what I believe. So one of um, one of the one of the things that I often like to discuss with them, and I discuss this with my male friends as well, but I get a I tend to get a very different response from my male friends, and I'll get into that in a bit. With my female friends, one of the issues that I run into is that I try to, I like to analyze things systemically. I'm not only trained as a systems analyst um, from my bachelor's education, but it's also something that's very intuitive to me. I don't like to examine things instance by instance. You know, one situation, 
for me, you can't generalize a single situation. You can't generalize a sample of one. I don't even know if you can, I don't think you can comfortably generalize a sample of 10 either, um, unless your population is 10. So, but anyways, <laughs> so I, I like to look at things systemically. You know, what's been the pattern over time? And one of the patterns over time that I've noticed is, is, is this, this friend zoning behavior. And it's been very consistent for me in that, you know, I, I tend to be very, um, I tend to per give a lot of attention to the people I'm interested in. Um, you know, I, I tend to be reasonably proactive. I, I, I tend to dote a little bit, as it were, on, on them. And it's what I notice, and this is, this is somewhat corroborated, mostly corroborated by, um, secondhand observation from my friends, um, is that in doing that, I, it seems that the women that I do that with aren't terribly interested in me. Now, when I speak with my female friends about this, a lot of the response is, well, that's something that's unique to that woman. Okay, I can, I can understand that if we're talking, you know, one, two, three, four instances, but I've, I've had a fair amount of relationships in my life. Actually, as I realized when I hit grad school, I've had a lot more than I think is average. Um, I think I'm up to maybe about 20 to 30 at this point, which, which is odd for me because given some of the friends that I know, that actually doesn't feel like very much. Anyways, that's a relativistic argument, but, um, so I'm not exactly, it's not exactly like I have a small sample to work with here. And this, this is something that comes up a lot and not, 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 and obviously not just within my relationships because, you know, for every relationship I've had, there's been at least three or four women that I've been interested in and have in some way done some form of active engagement and, and, um, interaction with to develop a relationship. And FYI, when I use the word relationship here, I'm meaning it specifically in the I have romantic interest for this person, not in the broad I have an interaction with this person sort of sense. Just a point of clarification. So for me, because I'm running into this so frequently, I'm starting to see a systemic issue here. And the closest I can figure is that it has to do with a lot of the, um, a lot of the gendered assumptions that are built into our into our modern society now people are going to make a nature versus nurture argument here and for me that's a completely irrelevant thing they're they're intermingled i mean you, you can't really separate a person's biology from a person's psychology not not really yes you can separately analyze them and come up with you know different conclusions but the it's it, it, a whole nother tangent there. Basic idea is that when I'm talking about a lot of these cultural things, I do actually mean both the nature and the nurture aspects of, of this. And, you know, there there is some variation in, in which one is more prevalent and whatnot, but it, it's complicated. Let me put it to you that way. So I'm not trying to simplify it and say that culture is responsible for everything. I personally feel that culture is more influential than biology, but again, it's such an intertwined thing that I cannot really separate them out. And even and in some ways, even me just making that bad monitor, even me just making that statement is self-contradictory. So I'll make another video about that at some point. But so I see this systemic issue that's coming up here that I feel is rooted in the way that I'm expected to interact with women and that I'm not following that. So I'm not getting the response that would normally elicit what I'm hoping to get out of those interactions, you know, the development of a relationship, which is not happening in a lot of circumstances. So because of that, um, I'm, because it's such a common occurrence, I feel that it's systemic. But when I try to discuss it as a systemic problem with my female friends, most of them just dismiss that and talk about how it's a case by case situation. However, looking back, switching things around a little bit, a lot of the feminist modern feminists, and also some second wave and first wave feminism talks about this as well, not unfairly, mind you, but a lot of the feminist um, discourse involves discussions of systemic problems. So in a way, or at least from, from, you know, women's issues, you know, if you look at domestic abuse, it's a perfect example. That is seen as a systemic issue. 
And I mean, it's 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 one that is seen as something that we as a species, as as a nation, as a community, as you know, we as people in general need to engage in and not that it's a case by case thing, but that it's this broader social issue. So in a way, it feels kind of hypocritical to me because the experience that I'm having as a man, a men's issue, and I, I feel this happens um, with a lot of other men's issues as well, where they get tunneled into this, well, this is just happening because uh, because of, of the, the unique nature of, the situ of that individual situation, as opposed to taking this broader systemic perspective of, okay, yeah, there's this, there's this larger issue around what's going on that isn't being discussed or isn't being, you know, really examined. And, and it, it's, 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 it's shifting it, reducing the men's, reducing men's issues. I guess the, the summary point here is that it feels like men's issues are getting reduced to this sort of individualistic private realm kind of discussion, which really limits the ability to engage with it in a broader perspective, whereas with, whereas with women's issues, it's getting broadened out to this sort of larger, kind of more encompassing social public venue. And you know, I think this traces back to the, the personal is political idea, um, which is, is actually something I kind of agree with. Um, that came out of second wave feminism. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's a logical conclusion. You know, if you have something that's, if you have harm that is being protected by the private sphere, what you want to do is to claim that that, to, to push that harm into the public sphere so that it can get engaged in a public fashion as opposed to continuously being hidden behind the private, private sphere. But in the same way, the opposite can happen where an issue can be marginalized and minimalized to the extent that in a way that it's pushing it into the private sphere by claiming that it is the responsibility of the individuals involved and is not something that is indicative of a broader social systemic issue. So in a way, this is where I think the double standard is coming in here when it comes to examining these, the, these the men's issues versus women's issues. Women's issues, you know, I think largely because of feminism, have this sort of defaulted public sphere analysis, you know, framework or, or, or place. They, they, they sort of default into the public sphere as being a broader social issue. Whereas men's issues, however, are often seen as, as, as personal, private, individual, where they default into that. Part of it, I think, is, is due to the, you know, the, the cultural roles of men and women, where, you know, men are, are supposed to, supposed to be more private and more personal. But I think also part of it is due to a lot of the, a, a lot of the intentional sort of, how do I call it? Sort of, uh, sort of an, an, an intentional push from modern third wave feminism with the idea that women's rights are inherently tied to, uh, women's expanding rights are inherently tied to men's declining rights. And in a way, if men's issues are pushed into the private sphere, then that will limit the amount of rights uh, that men have just by the simple fact that these issues cannot be discussed. Because once you enter the private sphere, it's private. That's it. It doesn't matter. It's all about individual one-on-oneness. There is no systemic issue in the private sphere. So it's, it's an issue that I've got. And and I, I would love to see that discussed and analyzed in a more detailed fashion because I really feel that my experience as a man and in conversations with other men, friend of, friends of mine who have gone through similar things, it, it's, it is a broader issue than one individual. I feel that there's a, there's a lot of evidence to support that there is a systemic issue around this friend zone thing and around a lot of men's issues as well that just gets shuffled off to the side because there's this assumption that a men that a man that men's issues are the realm of the private sphere as opposed to the public sphere that they are not systemic that they are not something that exists in a broader social um issue frame and i i just i can't agree you know men's issues and women's issues can can i honestly think exist in both there are aspects of men's issues that I think are private and individualized and, and can be distilled down into the individual players involved in that circumstance. There are aspects of men's issues which are part of larger systemic problems that we as a society are 
challenged with. And the same goes for women's issues as well. Um, but it's, it, it seems, I, 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 the sense I get is that a lot of the, a lot of the discourse makes assumptions about where, where those issues go based on the gender that is attributed to that issue. So it's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's very frustrating for me. And, you know, I, I really appreciate Girl Rights What for kind of digging into this. I, I love to know if there's, if there's some, if there's a, if there's a perspective on there that sort of examines that, that sort of private versus public kind of default state that seems to occur between men's issues and women's issues. So anyways, um, I'm at 30 minutes. Yay, I made it 30 minutes. <laughs> so I am going to call this video quits for now. Um, and I will see if I can whip up another one. Please provide feedback, comments, etc., cetera, whatnot uh, below. I'd love to hear your thoughts and opinions on this issue. Um, it's, you know, because this is stuff that's meaningful to me and I, I want to learn more um, because I like learning. <laughs> so anyways, um, this has been Jason. Peace out.